This is Nightly Business Report with Sue Herrera and Bill Griffin. Tech check. Alphabet crashes earnings expectations. Intel says the future looks bright, but Amazon's record profit run comes to an end. Changing flight plan, American and Southwest Airlines are shifting strategies as the grounding of Boeing 737 MAX ripples through the industry. New way to save. California is tackling the retirement crisis with a program to help 7 million workers prepare for the future. Those stories and much more tonight on Nightly Business Report for Thursday, July 25th. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. A big night for big tech. Amazon, Alphabet, and Intel, some of the largest companies in the sector, are out with their quarterly results just one day after the Nasdaq hit a record. The group has been a major driving force behind the market's rally, despite the threat of regulation from lawmakers and being the target of inquiries from government agencies. But let's start with the biggest of them all, Amazon. The company's record profit streak is over. The online retailer reported mixed results, missing earnings expectations, but exceeding revenue forecasts. Amazon cited high shipping costs and weaker than expected growth in its cloud computing business. Investors were disappointed and sent the stock lower in initial after hours trading. And then there's Alphabet, the parent company of Google, easily topped earnings expectations and reported a rebound in revenue growth thanks to strength in its advertising business. Investors cheered in initial after hours trading tonight, sending that stock sharply higher. We have two reports tonight for you. In a moment, it will be Josh Lipton on Alphabet, but we begin with Deirdre Bosa on Amazon. Big question for Amazon this quarter was, could they reaccelerate revenue growth as it goes into spending mode with pricey initiatives like one day shipping? Total sales did grow over the quarter, but at 20%, it was still short of the levels of the last few years. Meanwhile, profits took a hit, missing Wall Street's expectations and coming down from record levels. Amazon also telling investors to expect more investment ahead as it continues to implement one day shipping. Deirdre Boza, Nightly Business Report. Alphabet stock has been badly lagging the market this year, in part because of concerns about slowing growth. But the company just said its net revenues actually accelerated, jumping 21 percent. Oppenheimer's Jason Helfstein says a lot of hedge funds were short Alphabet, too, which could also explain the stock's move. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Josh Lipton at San Francisco. Now, here's why these reports are so important. Uh, when taken together, Amazon and Alphabet make up 13% of the NASDAQ Composite Index. And when you add in Dow Component Intel, together they make up 7% of the S&P 500. And that brings us to Intel's quarterly results, which blew past earnings estimates and topped revenue forecasts. The semiconductor company also confirmed that Apple is acquiring the majority of its smartphone business for $1 billion. That sent the stock higher in initial after-hours trading. John Ford has more on Intel's results. Chip giant Intel out with a report for the second quarter that beat on the top and bottom line. Sales just stronger than expected, and that led to an improved outlook for the full year. Intel CEO Bob Swan saying it was really the growth in data, just data applications, the demand for data that power the PC business as well as the cloud business which uses Intel server chips and that's what led to the outperformance in expectations. Now at the same time as Intel announced earnings also announced that it was selling its smartphone modem business the majority of it to Apple for a billion dollars and that includes 2200 employees as well as facilities and patents. That's a big deal that was expected. For Nightly Business Report I'm John Fort. On Wall Street, the Fed was back in focus today as well, with investors growing concerned about the central bank's next move after this morning's strong durable goods report and also comments from the head of the European Central Bank. Orders for long-lasting goods rose by 2 percent in June. That was the fastest rate of growth we've seen since August of last year. It was well above expectations, and it could mean an upward revision of GDP forecasts and a less aggressive interest rate cut from the Fed next week. Also this morning, the European Central Bank's President Mario Draghi left the door open for an interest rate cut later this year, but he also said there was not a significant risk of a recession in that region. 
So investors hoping for a big rate cut next week turned cautious. The Dow fell by 128 points to 27,140. NASDAQ was down 82. The S&P slid by 15. So what will that strong, durable good report and comments from the head of the European Central Bank mean for the Fed when it meets next week? We're joined by Rob Martin, senior U.S. economist at UBS. Welcome, Rob. Nice, nice to have you here. Yeah, thank you for having me. I now, appreciate it. You are expecting a cut of at least 25 basis points. Does what happened in Europe today with Mr. Draghi's comments or the durable goods report change your attitude about what's going to happen? Well, let's focus on the data first. The, you know, this morning's report on durable goods was just one more piece of evidence um, that the U.S. economy actually really is doing quite well. It's, it's growing nicely. We've had a string of strong reports. Um, so far, the Fed has looked through them, but the, the evidence is accumulating. That's going to reduce the risk of a big cut. And also, Fed Chairman Powell has been uh, mentioning the global economy, uh, which clearly is slowing down. China and parts of Asia and even Europe at this point. So a rate cut next week, would that be not just for our economy, but for the global economy as well? Well, it's not so much that they would cut rates for the global economy. It's that they worry that whatever is dragging down those other economies, whatever is weighing on growth in Europe, whatever is weighing on growth in Asia is also going to affect the U.S. economy, both through the direct ties, through trade, for example, and because the U.S. is subject to those same kind of uncertainties. The Fed already believes that there's a confidence shock working its way through the economy. The weakness in Europe is one of the reasons they really want to cut rates. Uh, and the, this, but the strength of U.S. data, the strength of the U.S. economy, makes it difficult for them to go big. Um, and that's why, that's why there's this debate between 50 basis points or 25 basis points. Right. We see 50, uh, but 25 is clearly on the table. Either way, mm -hmm. they do want to provide accommodation. A lot of times the market looks to what the Fed says after its actions. In other words, the statement. Are you expecting any major changes in the language that the Fed uses? No, we think they'll be pretty comfortable with their um, with their language. Whether they go 25 or 50, they don't want to signal that they're completely done with rate cuts because they're still nervous about the outlook. They want to wait and see how the data is going to evolve. And so I suspect in their new language that they will be closely monitoring um, the economy coming into the September meeting as well. I mean, you have to admit, it is a, a rather interesting time for them to be cutting with the uh, consumers so strong right now. The employment picture, the best in 50 years, and yet inflation is not where they want it to be. That's right. So, so inflation simply refuses to move up to 2%. They've got these worries about foreign growth. They've got worries about that confidence shock. This is what's driving them. So it feels that there's some tension between what they want to do, cutting rates, and what we're seeing in the economy. But to be fair to them, that low inflation and those, con those real concerns about foreign growth um, push them to, to some kind of easing in the near term. We will see. Rob Martin with UBS. Rob, thanks. Thank you. More earnings now. 3M is feeling the impact of a slowing global economy right now. The company saw its profits drop more than 30 percent. Sales slid as well. The industrial conglomerate cited weaker demand from China. In response, it cut production and reduced inventory, but it did reaffirm its previous outlook for the whole year, and the stock fell just a fraction in today's session. The ongoing grounding of Boeing 737 MAX is rippling through the airline industry. American Airlines and Southwest both reported better than expected earnings, but also said the results in the second half could be impacted. Southwest now says it won't fly the MAX before January of next year. That resulted in a mixed finish for the stocks. Phil LeBeau is in Fort Worth, Texas for us tonight. The 737 MAX headache for American and Southwest Airlines has turned into a problem that is changing how the carriers will operate the rest of this year. It's not a good situation. We're not happy about it. Uh, you saw here in the second quarter it cost us $175 million, uh, and that will be more uh, in the third quarter. With 34 MAX models grounded for at least a couple more months, Southwest says its capacity will drop in the second half of 2019. To make the most of a smaller than expected fleet, Southwest will stop flying out of Newark and it'll focus its New York operations on LaGuardia Airport. As airlines keep extending how long it will be before they expect to fly the MAX, they are left with more questions than answers about the beleaguered plane's future. 
We remain in limbo, as everybody else does, as we, uh, as we wait uh, to hear from the FAA as to when they come to the conclusion that the aircraft is ready to go back in service again. Boeing will pay billions of dollars for the hundreds of MAX planes that have been grounded. For airlines, the money will not be enough to cure MAX issues expected to linger well into next year. We're unhappy that it's taken so long and um, we're in the dark, on, just like you are, on a number of technical matters. American and Southwest believe they will eventually get past the grounding of the MAX, but it won't be quick, nor will it be easy. And it will likely take well into next year to repair the damage of not having the plane. Phil LeBeau, Nightly Business Report, Fort Worth, Texas. Meanwhile, today an FAA official said there is still no timeline for the Boeing 737 MAX to return to service. The acting administrator said that when the airplane's issues are addressed and the MAX is safe, it will return to service. And yesterday, Boeing CEO told analysts he was confident the MAX could be back in service as early as October. It is time to take a look at some of today's upgrades and downgrades. UPS was upgraded to buy from neutral at Bank of America Merrill Lynch. The analyst cites what he calls e-commerce revolution and the company's plan to expand deliveries to seven days. The price target is $130. The stock rose 3% to $118.25. AT&T was upgraded to neutral from underperform at Credit Suisse. The analyst says video subscriber losses have peaked. The price target is $29, and that stock rose more than 1.5% to $33.81. And Caterpillar was downgraded to neutral from buy at Buckingham. The analyst cites a lack of catalysts that will drive the stock in the near term and sees a higher probability of lower earnings growth. The price target is $140. Despite the downgrade, though, the shares rose 2% to $134.71. Still ahead, if they build it, builders say they'll come. I'm Diana Olick in San Antonio, Texas. I'll have a new twist on the fastest growing segment of the housing market coming up on Nightly Business Report. In Washington, the House passed the debt ceiling and the budget deal. It sets discretionary spending at about $1.4 trillion. The agreement also suspends the borrowing limit for two years. That measure now goes to the Senate, which is expected to pass it in the coming days. Nissan plans to lay off more than 12,000 workers. That's 9 percent of its global workforce. The restructuring comes after the automaker saw profits essentially disappear, falling more than 98 percent compared to last year. The company has faced a number of challenges, not the least of which is the arrest in Japan of its former chairman Carlos Ghosn eight months ago and the tensions that caused with Nissan's partner Renault, which Ghosn also ran. It was a rough day in the market for Ford following its earnings report, which we told you about last night. The automaker issued a disappointing forecast for the year. Analysts are concerned that the lineup of vehicles launched into next year could further delay an improvement in profitability. The stock fell more than 7 percent in today's session. Clearly, the auto industry is in transition as it cuts back on the number of traditional sedans that it makes and gets ready to produce more electric and autonomous vehicles. What does that do to earnings in the meantime? Joining us is Matt DiLorenzo. He's with Kelly Blue Book. Matt, good to see you again. Thanks for joining us tonight. Great to be here. It is a transition period right now. I mean, Ford is targeting 2022 to be able to introduce some of these electric vehicles that it plans to produce. But in the meantime, what happens? I mean, they have to cut back here and there and invest an awful lot of money. Well, they do. Uh, they're playing it out in terms of the transition because of their scale. Uh, their biggest selling vehicle is a full-size pickup truck. And that's what the market's demanding right now, those and uh, crossover SUVs. So uh, in the short term, they've bet heavily on the truck market. I I'm sure they're going to see some returns uh, from it because the margins typically in that part of the uh, market are a lot higher than they are in the traditional sedan market. 
But as Bill mentioned, they either have to invest a lot of money or find some other avenue to, to the direction that the rest of the auto industry is going in. Does that mean partnerships? Does that mean mergers? What do you think? I think in the short term or medium uh, long range term, uh, they're going to be uh, relying on partnerships. The deal with VW to use the MEB platform, which will be primarily for the car side of the business. And then they also have that $500 million investment in Rivian, uh, which builds uh, uh, electric trucks and SUVs. So I think what they're trying to do is lay off a lot of development costs and infrastructure costs in terms of production facilities um, to these partners and hope that the demand uh, for electric vehicles and autonomous vehicles uh, rises to where they can uh, make that switch over internally and, and develop and build those vehicles on their own. You anticipated my next question. What do you think the demand will be for those electric vehicles? I mean, I guess, I don't know, it may depend on how old you are and your experience right. with those cars, <laughs> right? I, I think that's true. I, I think in the short term, uh, electrics will uh, tend to uh, move quicker up in, in sales. There's still a lot of regulatory hurdles that have to be um, uh, uh, surmounted before we can get to full level five autonomous vehicles being on the road. Once we get to that point, then we look at how the ownership model is going to change. And if people stop owning cars or start sharing cars, there could be a drop in production and that could uh, have an impact on earnings down the road. They're, they're, they could be in a position where they're not building as many vehicles because not that many vehicles will be needed right. since people will be sharing them and they'll be running around the clock. So many questions, so many changes coming. We know that. Matt DiLorenzo right. with Kelly Blue Book. Again, thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you. Strong results give Starbucks a jolt, and that's where we begin tonight's market focus. The company topped estimates thanks to an increase in same-store sales here in the U.S. and globally. Starbucks added about 400,000 members to its U.S. loyalty program, and it raised its full-year guidance. Shares initially rose in after-hours trading. They closed the regular session up a fraction at 90.98. Also, after the bell, T-Mobile posted mixed results as it beat earnings estimates, but it fell short in revenue. The mobile carrier saw an increase in subscriptions and raised its guidance. The shares were volatile in the after hours, and they closed the regular session down a fraction to 79.91. AB InBev beat estimates thanks to seeing its beer sales grow the fastest in five years. The world's largest brewer also had more consumers buying higher priced products as the company has been trying to sell more expensive premium drinks. The shares rose more than 4% to 99%. Bristol-Myers topped estimates fueled by strong sales of its Eliquis blood thinner and Orencia arthritis treatment. The drug maker also lifted its full-year guidance. Shares rose 5% today to 45.40. Comcast beat earnings estimates but fell short on revenue expectations. The company added more customers to its high-speed Internet service, but it saw a decline in its video and phone businesses. Shares were down a fraction to 44.61, and we need to mention that Comcast is the parent of NBC Universal, which produces this program. Hershey topped estimates, but the candy maker gave weak guidance due to a wholesale price increase of its single-serve products, which affects about a third of its total sales. Hershey raised prices to offset higher labor and raw material costs. Shares rose 2% to 149.72. An increase in travel bookings helped Royal Caribbean beat estimates, but the cruise operator lowered its guidance partly due to canceled trips to Cuba because of the return of those U.S. travel restrictions to that country. Shares were down almost 2% to 113.04. And Align Technology fell short of earnings estimates due to what the company called a tougher consumer environment and slower sales in China. The maker of the Invisalign braces also issued weak guidance. Shares plummeted today nearly 27 percent to 290. Mortgage rates are close to a three-year low. According to Freddie Mac, the 30-year fixed-rate mortgage averaged 3.73 percent. Now, just a year ago, that average rate was 4.5 percent. And despite those lower mortgage rates, demand for rental homes is growing, and builders are stepping up to meet that need, redesigning and reimagining the single-family rental. And they're becoming landlords in the process. Diana Oleg is in San Antonio for us tonight.
Millennials Taylor Walters and Pari Dilks want to get out of their rental apartment and into a larger single-family home. Yeah, we've been looking online for months now for whether we want to buy, whether we want to rent, and yeah, this is definitely up our alley. This is a brand new community of 250 detached homes built entirely as rentals. While some builders will sell a few homes to investors as rentals, this is one of the first gated rental-only projects. The brainchild of Mark Wolf, founder and CEO of AHV Communities, partnering with Bristol Group. About 93% of the apartment stock consists of studios, ones and two bedrooms, very few three bedrooms. We saw a growing need coming out of the downturn to provide three and four bedroom homes for the renter society. He's basically taking the vertical apartment model and turning it horizontal, offering three and four bedroom homes with two car garages, but including high end amenities like a gym, common areas, a dog park and washing station. The rents are comparable to nearby apartments and the maintenance is all on site, lowering costs for AHV. Wolf says he does not intend to sell the homes anytime soon. Well, we believe in the long-term cash flow game. So if you hold these properties for 10 plus years or even seven plus years, the residual cash flow is worth more than the sale one time. Last year, about 43,000 homes were built to rent, according to the U.S. Census, the highest in nearly 40 years. Investors are pouring into the space, which is why big builders like Lennar and Toll Brothers are now building homes to sell to them. Renting used to come with a social stigma. Home ownership was, of course, the American dream. But the average income of renters in this new community is in the six figures. Many of them can afford to buy a home. They simply choose not to. So I've done research, read different articles on millennials buying houses, and I think the biggest thing is the hidden costs that we might incur. The yards here are small, and the houses closer together to lower costs for AHV. There's a lot that goes into that recipe for success. Renters here pay their utilities and a landscape fee, and the rent, just the rent. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Diana Olick in San Antonio. Coming up, California's plan to bridge the retirement savings gap. We have been reporting quite a bit on the push in Washington to get more Americans to save for retirement. Well, several states are also tackling that problem. California is the latest. It now requires small businesses to either join a state-sponsored retirement savings program or offer a private plan. Sharon Epperson has our story. 27-year-old Ramon Gonzalez believes in having a game plan at work and for his own finances. So roughly a month, I'm saving about $250. A production supervisor at Red Bay Coffee in Oakland, California, Gonzalez is saving for his future in a new workplace retirement plan called Cal Savers. I'll have a, a nice little lump sum when the year's over and going forward. Red Bay was one of the first small businesses in California to enroll its 40-some employees in this state-sponsored program, allowing private sector employees to save and invest in an individual retirement account at work. We uh, are open to full and part-time employees and soon to those uh, uh, independent contractors or gig workers. While not a traditional 401k plan, it is designed to help bridge the savings gap for workers who do not have access to an employer-sponsored plan. More than 7 million California workers have no retirement savings plan at work. Two-thirds are at small businesses with fewer than 100 employees. Por esa razón me siento muy contenta. 49-year-old Maria del Carmen Castillo Vasquez, who cleans offices in the San Francisco Bay Area, is now starting to save for her own future and her family. She is very happy that she has this um, type of savings plan. Um, but she have never had one before. Janico's founder and president, Lorenzo Harris, says he can now offer employees, including Maria, a much-needed benefit that also benefits the business. Pretty comprehensive. Cal Savers allows us to help to level the playing field 
when it comes to attracting and retaining good workers. Through CalSavers, employees can put away a portion of their pay into an account that works like a Roth IRA. Contributions are made in after-tax dollars, and the funds can then be withdrawn tax-free in retirement. The maximum contribution in 2019 is $6,000, or 7000 if you're 50 or older. Employees are automatically defaulted uh, at a savings rate of 5%. That 5% comes directly out of the wages, and an employee can increase that amount, they can decrease that amount, or they can opt out altogether. Most of the employees at Red Bank Coffee are participating in this portable program, and if they switch jobs, they can take their accounts with them. Heading towards you in a second. Ramon Gonzalez has no plans to leave the company anytime soon, but he does have a plan in place to build his own financial security. So it feels good to work at some place that's very rewarding personally, and also knowing that I'm going to reap the fruits of my labor later on. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Sharon Epperson. And before we go, here's a look at the day's final numbers from Wall Street. The Dow fell 128 points to 27,140. The Nasdaq was down 82, and the S&P 500 slid 15. And that'll do it for Nightly Business Report tonight. I'm Sue Herrera. Thanks for joining us. I'm Bill Griffith. Have a great evening. See you tomorrow.